So the first question I'm going to ask you guys. In your day-to-day -day lives, do you use violence to solve your personal problems? Not typically. Not typically? Yeah, not typically. Not typically. All right, so like, let's define the term violence, right? So violence will be defined as placing a person in an involuntary position without their consent of choice, right? I rape, murder, theft, That's and like assault. like an aggression axiom. Non yeah, yeah. You guys have heard of that. Okay, cool. <laughs> I read a lot of Friedman, so. Okay, nice. <laughs> I've met his son, um, uh, David Friedman. I was referring recently. to David. Oh, you're right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Machinery of freedom. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, radical capitalism. Wow. Okay, you as well then. Uh, no. Not, as, not, yet, not yet, right? <laughs> uh, all right, so would you consider then, with that definition, that in your day-to-day -day life that you use violence to solve your personal problems? No. Not usually, no. Right, and it's not have you ever, right? Yeah. Um, and then the question be, next question would be, would you consider then wrong and immoral to initiate force? That depends on whose moral code we're talking about. Initiating force, initiating violence. Would you consider wrong and immoral to violate the consent of another person? To rape, murder, theft, or assault another person? Once not, again, that depends on, on whose moral code well, we're talking about. That's why I'm about. asking your moral code. Right? Areas outside of self-defense. Self-defense is not the initiation of force. Self-defense is defending yourself from the initiation of force of yourself and other people. Generally, yeah. In right. a practical sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you're initiating, that then breaks the axiom. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the last question would be, would you consider then wrong and immoral to violently force your ideas onto other people? Well, I think that's just self-explanatory, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, sir? I don't think it's useful whether or not it's moral or not. Like, for example, if you didn't like what I had to say, you could ignore me, walk away, ostracize me. But if I came after you and grabbed you and threatened you at gunpoint to say, you have to do what I say, would you, now I'm violently forcing my ideas onto you. Would you consider that to be wrong and immoral? I wouldn't enjoy it. It's a simple question. What? Well, not that too much if you have a BDSM preference and enjoying a particular kink <laughs> of uh, that sort of sense, would you consider it wrong or immoral to violently force your ideas onto other people? For the sake of this, I'll say yes, but I'm skeptical of moral absolutes. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why I ask, right, what your moral uh, thoughts are before we can continue on other parts of the conversation. All right, so perfect. So you guys tell me your day-to-day -day life. You have a plurality of nonviolent solutions you apply and use to solve your personal problems. You have this moral integrity against that violence. And as a community of individual people here in Richmond, though, we're told the only way we can affect any kind of change or make any difference, though, is through government, through politics, vote, they say. So people vote with their ideas, opinions, and preferences and how best to solve that community problem. And in effect, they elect a politician. That politician, his or only job is to legislate those ideas and opinions into law. And then those laws of opinions are then backed and enforced by the police at gunpoint. You could take a uh, government opinion that cannabis is bad for everyone. If I were to smoke a plant, I'd be kidnapped, arrested, thrown into a cage, a prison, at which point, at any point I refuse or resist because I don't agree with that idea or opinion and try to run away and escape, I'd be met with more violence or something mm -hmm. shot, murdered. At the same time, governments have even found the more violence because at no point can you say, I do want to help the poor, but I don't want to fund war. You have no freedom of economic choice. You still have to give government your money. You still have to give up your property. You still have to pay your taxes. Because if you did have a freedom of economic choice and how best to spend your own money, how best to allocate your own resources, government wouldn't threaten to send you to another cage if you didn't pay your taxes. So this is how government is immoral. Then. This organization that calls itself the government then only knows how to solve problems the one way, a singular way, and that's through the threat of and use of violence to solve any problems versus the plurality of nonviolent solutions that us three here already share. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I I don't disagree with any of that. Beautiful. <laughs> this is how it is. All right, you, sir? It makes sense, I suppose. All right. And I come from a very skeptical point of view of, of a great many things as well. Yeah. Uh, I think there was a skeptical group here in Richmond a couple of years ago, and one in D.C., uh, the skeptics, I think, that they were called. So. It's original. All right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess what, what about um, areas of, um, do you find agreement? You mentioned, like, you come across uh, David Freeman's machine or Freeman. What do you think about the work of... Uh, a, a free society, but the absence of this coherent organization known as government. I think it's idealistic, but I think there's a lot of tenets of it that I think could work. So, like which ones? This is all. I, I think that if people wouldn't initiate violence, people wouldn't force their will on other people. That it'd be weird at first. You're familiar with the J curve, right? No. About how there's when you're going from it's a correlation between freedom and government control. So I think if there was to be a state all of a sudden that private, how do I phrase this? Give me a second. If the free market was to be like the, the overwhelming force, supply and demand, you know what I mean? Yes. That ultimately the best outcome would happen because you always have the, you always have the option to leave. Yeah, freedom of association. But I think if it's free, like, I'm not saying that you can't have police. I'm not saying you can't have military. 
but the fact that I don't have an ability to opt out of that without going somewhere else, that is the same system, and you're not free. In a free market? No, no, I'm saying oh, no, yeah, other than a free market. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 without, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying it's not a free market. Right, it's not. Situation. It's a state-controlled market, right? Yeah. Um, I still want to say a guided market, but it's not... It's, man or control it, it's free or it's, it's not. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't think it's a very subjective question. You're free or you're not free. Very true. Yeah, that's it. You're either, or you're either free as an individual mm-hmm. or you're a slave, right, as mm-hmm. a tax slave. And, of course, in this situation, recognizing that this is a tax farm that we're kind of forced to live under, uh, I will recognize myself as a prisoner then to that kind of mad fantasy that other people are your property, mm-hmm. right, and what's what government out there conveys. Uh, and what are your thoughts uh, in that regards? In terms of what? In terms of the economic freedom? I guess, or? yeah, economic freedom. I guess, uh, what do you imagine in terms of uh, a free society based on consent versus a world in which you have an organization that can tell you what you can and cannot do with your body, with your land, with your property, uh, with every absence of your life that makes you an individual? I'd say that a free society based on consent would necessitate that sort of stuff. It wouldn't necessitate a taking for the greater good so to choose it would leave the greater good up to the individuals to determine right. yeah now we can have thousands of free societies basic consent catering to our lifestyle and preferences i could live now in a community that was fortunately friendly one across the river that's not perfect like the amish i never hear them like jumping over people's fences and trying to force their way of life onto others right yeah and then we have rules that we can give finally explicit consent to and agree to the consequences right uh, and I think that's like the beauty of the market providing these mm-hmm. services. Whereas government has a monopoly on these services that you and I want. Because I do want roads, I want law, I want security, I want all these things. But I want ABC, alcohol, right? But no one's allowed to compete with them. You're not, you don't have well, the freedom. That is a monopoly. It is a monopoly, find, yeah. Which I find odd that, who was it? Was it Rockefeller's? What you call a monopoly, I call enterprise. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Um, government that is a monopoly that, itself. That just means no one else has come up with a better idea in the free market sense. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, uh, people are talking about like uh, Standard Oil, for example, in the past and uh, how they were monopolistic. Look, they have a large market share, uh, and they were not the only people out there competing in the market. There are hundreds and hundreds of other people domestically and yeah. internationally. Uh, Pure Oil, uh, all kinds of oil companies out there. It was able to outperform them, providing a better service, mm-hmm. higher quality, lower price, and it was the jealous people out there who didn't like him competing and, and being a good entrepreneur that used the government to pass the, uh, the antitrust laws and Sherman Act to, to break them down and, and destroy that kind of competition. Yeah. Uh, but without that, yeah, uh, without this monopoly called the government, anyone can compete. Anyone, you know, let your own merit that's in the that's, saying, that's, that's where innovation comes from. Yes. <laughs> it's just that being in constant competition, I mean, it's hard to get comfortable when someone else is always trying to do it. You know what I mean? Right. And I think to the ability, you're going to have better products because you have to have a better product to succeed in a free market. Right. There's, you, no, there's no government crutch. Right. There's no rules. There's no... The only rule is create the best product. Exactly. Have the best city, the best bicycle, the best school. Right. And if everyone's working hardest to make the best possible product, then wouldn't society be better? Yes. Because people are trying to build the best possible society. That's what happens when you have market competition. Uh, quality goes up, cost, cost goes down. Look at plasma screen TVs a couple years ago, thousands of dollars. Today I could buy a better version for a few hundred bucks. Yeah. Right? Uh, whereas when you have a government monopoly, the opposite occurs. Cost goes up and quality goes down. Like you go to a local post office, like you're walking into like a you know, post-apocalyptic scene, you know, pay, uh, pain is peeling. They remove all the clocks, most of them, so you don't know how long you've been waiting in line. Well, did you hear about, a, it was Huntsville, I think it was a week ago. There was a veteran from the Iraq War came back and in the city of Hun- city limits of Huntsville, bought two acres. He put up a trailer with rain collecting water. I heard about this. And they're saying you can't do that because your methods of collecting water and electricity don't meet with our standards and codes. And he said, but it's my land, it's my property. They're like, you can't live on a trailer because, well, it's not, you can't do that here. Because strangers, it's not, it's not yeah. zoned. It's not zoned properly. He's like, I didn't zone my land. I came back from Iraq. I just want to live here. I think it was Iraq. Yeah. He's like, I just want to live on my property, and not do anything else. And they viewed that as a threat. Yeah. Who's the, who's the victim there? No one. No you, one. It's not a crime unless there's a victim. Right. So. And uh, yeah, I, I heard about that. And so you don't have the, the freedom to do what you will with your own property. Well, same thing. Tiny houses. houses. Tiny houses. I think are great. Same thing here in Richmond. There's some some guy in Richmond who was also trying to create a tiny house. Uh, local, I think it was Sussex, who came down hard on him and said that you can't you can't do that. And he was having yeah. a great time living in his own backyard in his own little tiny house, renting out his regular house for like maybe Airbnb or something like that. And you know, that's it. It's, it's none of no one's business what you do with your own mm-hmm. property. Well, look at, I, I had a friend in Fauquier County called Range 81. Yeah. He set up a shooting range. And they didn't, 
the county came down, they put signs up, stop the rain, stop the rain. He's like, wait, this is my land. They're like, well, bullets can shoot down this and that. So you have to put up, it was a 100-foot outdoor range. I think it was 10 lanes. Yeah. You have to put up a roof to stop bullets. But they didn't understand that a bullet's going to go through the piece of sheet metal he put the roofing over. I had a 30 out 6 and I shot through one of the steel beams. Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> same thing. They said, well, you can't shoot shotguns because shotguns can kill birds. They can kill birds. They can kill airplanes. Oh, my fucking God. And, and he said... I mean, the effective range of a shotgun is, after like 50 yards is gone, is that you're not going to get past that. Yes, they'll still go, but the only thing that could shoot down, theoretically has the range, would be the rifles, but you said that's okay because you don't hurt, hunt birds with them. And he's like, it just didn't make sense. He's like, on my land, why am I subject to your abstract way of thought? Right. Your lack of research now affects me and what I choose to do with the business I am trying to start. Right. Yeah, so. these, these people who are in charge, uh, these political council uh, rulership tradition, have no idea... How any of this stuff it's like works. a nanny state is what it is. Right. It, it is, is a nanny state. state. It is a nanny Even state. Even seatbelts. I think seatbelts are great on principle. Uh, go ahead. But why should I? It's principle. Yeah. I think everyone should wear a seatbelt. When I ride my bike, I wear a helmet. Right. Um, Don't because, force people Well, because to wear I, I've cracked my skull open. Right. I learned from that mistake. Hey, wear a helmet. I give my friends grief all the time. Wear seatbelts. Wear your helmets. But in my car, I won't drive unless you're all buckled in because I've seen the consequences of that. But to other people, they can't do that. Right. Uh, every time I have to, uh, I don't wear my seatbelt. I wear it over my left shoulder so it doesn't mess with my tie. But every time I have to do that, because I don't want to get pulled over for a victimless crime, and then they're going to threaten me to throw me into a cage. Yeah, yeah. like you, you should wear your seatbelt, but that's your choice. That's, that, that's my own risk to assess, right? A lot of people yeah. have a safe uh, comfortability that this is going to protect me, and that actually causes a lot of accidents like uh, red lights or camera lights and whatnot. Uh, Ralph Nader is the one who puts for that consumer law to, to be forced on everyone. Unsafe at any speed, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what they found is if you remove all the traffic lights and stop signs, in uh, many places in Europe where this is already done, traffic accidents went down dramatically. Congestion went down dramatically. People were able to go move around and, uh, and, and be mobile. It becomes a most, mostly a shared road experience for everyone. And I remember a specific case of some town in England where that was the case and the uh, fatality rate for accidents was so much lower than it was in right. terrible you, you can't make money places. without traffic tickets. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's such a bread and butter. It's not a consumer driven security. Have you driven in the mountains at all? In the mountains? Uh, you go in the Appalachian, you'll be, you'll be on the road it's like 65 miles an hour yeah. and instantly 25. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been up there. Yeah, like, it's just uh, yeah, all over the place because those little towns, their sole source of income is initiating conflict with drivers. Right. Now, people say, we write tickets to save lives. No, no you write tickets don't. to save money is because you're initiating conflict where there was no conflict right. initially. For the sake of generating revenue. Right. It's interesting you use the example of cannabis earlier. It's interesting how people say cannabis will, will ruin your life, but the only reason it will ruin your life is because you'll be sent to jail if you're caught with it. It's right. not anything about itself. It's the government monopoly creating harm. I have many friends who find it difficult to get a job now because they had a plant on their person, and a guy in a blue costume uh, threaded him you know, at gunpoint, kidnapped him, threw him in a cage, and said, well, that plan was going to ruin your life, so yeah, I'm going to ruin your life even more. And now it's difficult yeah. for them to have a good, sustained economic life with that thing on their record. Yeah, it's one of those things I don't. Right. I don't advocate people to do, but that's their choice. That's their purpose, I, yeah. I was talking to a homeless man earlier today. I hung out with him probably an hour on the street just talking to him. Uh, he liked my band shirt, and we were just talking about like music and whatnot. I was like, why, why, why are you in trouble getting a job? He was like, oh, because I went, I went to jail when I was younger. For Now that I can never get a job now. He's like, I cannot. Right. So. And, and, and this goes from, um, I call them police extortions, because that's what they are. They're not consumer driven. Um, many Supreme Court cases, like in um, DeShaney versus uh, Winnebago County, have ruled that there is no obligation to protect your life, liberty, or property. None. Doesn't exist. Well, that, that's true, because cops, by law, they do not have to protect you. For example, right. if a cop asks you to help them, you have to help them, or else you'll be punished. But if you're getting beat up, like I was in high school once. And there's this guy just sucker punched me in the back of the head, right? And the cop, the school cop, was like, "Looks like it hurt, boy." And I was just like, "Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's your job." And he's like, Pfft. "Right? Yeah, yeah no, no, just, no." And stuff like that all the time. You see the mentality. But I, I had a police officer come to my sociology class, and yeah. someone asked just to answer questions. Someone asked what the escalation of force. So the escalation of force was, well, if someone pulls a knife on me, I can use a baton. If they're not armed, I can use this. They it was just how to like treat different scenarios. And he tailed it with, but certain races are more aggressive than other races, and you have to raise the escalation of force to meet that racial aggression. So you see even then, it's just how would having an institution where there is no consequences for their action, because they're the administrators of it. Right. Well, who administers them? They don't no police one. themselves. If they police themselves, we wouldn't have these issues. Right. If they were as hard on themselves as they were everybody else, I would have no complaints with the police department. Right. 
Uh, yeah, and that's, that's today, so they're not consumer driven, so they, they can't measure their measure of success in terms of like, hey, we have a lot of subscription rates. Hey, look at all these customer feedback reviews. Hey, five stars out of five stars. Uh, we've been going great as a business in terms of profit. Uh, we can hire more people and expand. They can't measure that, but the only way they can measure it, like in our rest of the county, is to uh, how many people did I arrest today? Uh, well, there's quotas. There's quotas, right. There is quotas, which is horrendous. Yes, yes. For, for victimless crimes. Well, it's, you have to have quotas to keep up the demand for the prison economy. Right, right. That's where they get their money. Yeah. All these kind of government positions are welfare positions, and that's kind of where the they need. Uh, yeah, it's not for them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so you see, I guess a lot of these sort of areas, and this. Well, so you're liberated RBA. Well, you've heard of us. <laughs> no, All right. I, cool. I knew everything you were gonna say for a while. Okay. <laughs> I saw a little fine. Cal, correct? Yes. Yes. You are. Noah. Noah. Pleasure, man. Pleasure. I'm Nathan. Nathan. Pleasure. I, pleasure. I encountered you before. You were yelling at my friend at the SSA. Oh, he was the atheist. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't yelling. He was trying to say that uh, the social contract is a real tangible document and it exists. And I was yeah. like, eh, it's not. It's not as real as like Bigfoot or anything like that. But then he brought Bigfoot's up... Bigfoot's real, though. Yeah. Right? I mean, I've, real. I've heard compelling theories of justice before. I'm a philosophy major, political science minor. It's kind of my job to look into this stuff right now. But I, I don't find the social contract theory particularly compelling. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know Derek? Uh, yeah, yeah, the the like half his head yes, shape. Yeah, 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 I have yeah. several classes with him. All right, cool. He, he's also uh, an anarchist as well, part of the group. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so yes, that's that's uh, I guess um, the tabling. I still have that video, but I don't know what to do. I haven't really checked it out since uh -huh. afterwards. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so you, you you know what we're about then. We want to create a free society based on consent, and I don't find that to be idealistic. Free volunteerism. Right, volunteerism, uh, free market. Uh, uh, society, capitalism, real respect for property rights, self-ownership, right? Uh, I think in, in terms like that, it's kind of like when people complain about communism, it works on like a boats when everyone's on the same page. Yeah. So I think for the most part, everyone is on the same page. When you ask people the first three questions in your day-to-day -day life, you know, the, the questions of morality, you'll find there's about a majority of people here agree with that. Yes, I agree. But, uh, the, the consent of other people is something I hold value of high above everything else, right? And I think uh, most people just... We don't really know that. I think it's a hasty generalization then for anyone to say that they can't get it or it's difficult for them to understand or it's, um, I would say, idealism. Because I think government itself is idealism. Just the right amount of control and we, we got this. Well, what, what, what got me is when I have been like, uh, when I got political, I guess, when I started reading more, everything from Goldman to Friedman, everything between. So... And even Glenn Beck's books, people like that, yeah. just everybody's books. If they had a book, it was left or right. I was just getting interested in it, probably because I started listening to a lot of punk rock at the time. Nice, but, yeah. But uh, I guess that's, that happened. But anyway, I started looking into it, and then it, it occurred to me that it didn't make sense. It's not making sense. When my parents explained it to me was the whole lesser evil, you got to vote for lesser evils. And that, makes, that does make a certain degree of sense. Uh, if you're, for example, if you're gambling, you don't always get the best hand. So sometimes you have to work with the hand you're given to mitigate the amount you're going to lose. Or I could just acknowledge that I don't want to partake in either a greater evil or a lesser evil at all. Just right. keep my hands clean of all the evil. Yeah, not going to play, the game doesn't continue. I'm going to lose something either way. Right. And especially the, the lesser two evil, that makes a presumption to say that this violent sociopath promise. Now, like, can you really mm -hmm. think that violent sociopaths keep their yeah. promises and keep their word, that they're not going to hurt you there as are, much? There are politicians that I like more than others and some I like less than others. That being said, they're still politicians. Right. I remember someone asked me once, like, who are you going to vote for? I'm like, nobody, because I don't like any of them. But, Beautiful. And, and, they, and they said, well, how do you know you don't like them? I'm like, because they're running for office. I already know I don't like what they're going to say. Right. They're, they're because a, mi a minority is always going to lose. Right. Yes, I, I do believe that there are losers and there are winners here, but I don't want to have anything to do with that race. I don't want that blood on my hand. Yeah. Right. That participation, uh, the acknowledgement, the legitimization of that. There was a uh, saying once is... The sticker on the back of your car, the flag sticker on the back of your car means nothing to wipe the blood that's been shed in your name. Yeah. But that's what it is. So I think sometimes, as you said, self-defense is sometimes violence a tool. I think it is. But if you're continually carrying out violence, initiating it, then that, that's wrong. Right. I'm not saying you should stand there if someone's attacking you. But, right. But I, that was what, that's what government solution is, is always attacking. Right. Always violating consent, always initiating force. Uh, and you, you don't have the option. It's it's always coming forward. We don't want to resort to this. But we're going to, if you don't do exactly what we say. So even though there's not force carried out, there's, there's a sense of coercion there. It's a threat, there's a threat. of force. Yeah. It's a promise, really. Right. 
And it's, especially when you go through many of a, a government schools for thousands of hours or 12 years, you're going to come into believing that, you know, other ways to kind of justify it, right? The social contract is real, taxation is not theft. Uh, these are laws, not prison it is rules. Theft. Yeah, it is theft, right. Um, I think said, like, there's the whole give unto Caesar what is Caesar, but there's that, that train of thought. But it's one of those things is if I was giving money, I knew it was going to go to helping the homeless, to helping the poor. I wouldn't have many qualms with that because that's probably where it's going to go anyway. But there's a lot of things I don't want to fund, especially things that are coming back to hurt me. Right. As we discussed earlier, the prison economy, the police state, oil wars, there's a myriad of issues that, yeah. that I don't think are necessarily, I, I don't have educated enough opinions on. So if I can't justify, well, I'm for or against this war, why should I fund it? Right. And of course, with taxation, you have no choice. Where it goes, or how it's directed, or mm -hmm. what percentage, or any any of those factors. Uh, we have a party next month. We do like monthly gatherings, sometimes like weekly gatherings. Was too. it Liberty Gardens? Yeah, yeah, Anarchy Gardens. Yeah, Anarchy yeah. Gardens. Wow, nice. <laughs> and uh, there was a couple groups when I moved to Richmond that, and you ran across my radar. Uh, which one? Once. Which ones were there? It was the Wing Nuts as well. Oh, they're all gone. So the Ancons are all gone from Richmond. All gone. Yeah, I know. I, I know a few of them. <laughs> yeah, I know a few of them, and then there's. Rag and Bones. Rag and Bones is a bicycle co-op. Uh, uh, not particularly I, an comic place, but yeah. they, they were associated. I think Autumn Warbing. They have some. That my, are, my band used to practice in there. Nice. In their yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and same thing. You have a uh, Flying Brick. Flying Brick closed their doors two years ago. They're. I think they're moving into the bike shop now. I think they're moving with Rag and Bones. Let's check the last co-op meeting. All right. It's just uh, we're we're the only anarchist organization left. You know. Last yeah, no, I, I saw it in the minutes. I remember it was this August the Wingnuts that officially closed Out. up. Out. Who moved in? You know. I don't know, it's probably some other group, and then they, they painted over all the, the walls. The, I like the walls. Uh, yeah, 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 but it was like, uh, it turns like, I don't know. The mural. Aesthetics or whatnot. Uh, I remember they had the giant mural on the side. I don't know if that's still there. It's all gone. Is it? Yeah. I went there once. That was, I think, around the time they were moving out, so. All right. All gone. Uh, you know what's interesting? What's that? Uh, you know, May 1st, Sunday, is May Day. Mm -hmm. um, you know how many, uh, what, what the event's going to be like? What's that? Nothing. First time in Richmond history, nothing, no May Day parade. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> right? Last year there was about like maybe 50 people. There was more cops, I would say, uh, yeah. there than there were uh, protesters. How do you feel about people like Goldman? Uh, Emma Goldman? I mean, like uh, Alexander Berkman, her. Uh, oh, Ber 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 Berkman, like Ann Goldman, they're that posse of people. Right, right. I mean, uh, some, some of the solutions that they seek to try to bring about change are the same kind of things that government wants to you know mm -hmm. she was advocating for assassination of like business people well, how, yeah, how do you feel about yeah, alexander berkman's attempted assassination of frick i'm not quite from, too familiar with uh, during the well carnegie's right man frick there was the strikes uh, going on at their mills. yeah he was he was the one trying to assassinate him right yeah. and goldman was also a conspirator yeah, towards that. yeah and he said that it did break the non graxium principle because the pinkertons the private military force well the private eyes i guess had already killed union workers he said that Union workers are now being killed because of their refusal to work. He said... He's talking about the Homestead strike? Different one. Different one? Okay. Yeah, there, there was a couple. I gotta look at the one uh, outside of that. that Have you read a... the book Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Berkman? No. Oh, he discusses that, and I don't agree with everything he said. He's very ANCOM. All right. But I liked his discussion of... He, he talked a lot about the non-aggression principle, just nice. yeah. weighing it back and forth. It was very hippie for me. Right, right, right. They all are. Yeah. I mean, the thing with, like, uh, I got to take a look at the other incidents with the Pinkertons, for example, like back then. Because um, the Pinkertons were hired by Rockefeller and, more the, and Carnegie on separate occasions. Right. And there was the whole strikes in West Virginia, which they put a Gatling gun in the back of a pickup truck and they strafed the Union, uh, yeah, the union camps. Mm -hmm. And that caused the And then... I got to look at that. I don't, I don't know. I've never, I've never heard about that. I just saw mostly, particularly the Homestead one. Um, That's Lewis Ling, correct? I believe so, yeah. And, and of course, uh, People who were who wanted to work there were prevented by the union owners. People were part of yeah. the union, and then they took over the entire site. So they're initiating force. Now they're trespassing. Now they're stealing, and that's when the Pinkertons yeah. were caught up uh, to take it back. So people talk, well, who initiated force? What? Well, there yeah. we go. The unions. They prevented people who had, wanted yeah. nothing to do with the union to work, right? Uh, and all that was prevented. And I find so there's just too much talk of like solidarity amongst. It's like like a, a world, and calm. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you talk to people about that. Which doesn't leave room for other opinions. Yeah, I mean, I just, you don't have to agree with Ivan do as long as it doesn't affect me. Right. And among idealistic ideologies, anarcho-communism is probably the most. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, I've read a lot of it. The most uh, really, inconsistent because they say like, "Hey, uh, I'm on against the police state, but they advocate for minimum wage." Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, well, who do you think enforces like, that? Minimum wage, I think, is a good idea from an individual company. Like, we pay our workers a minimum of this. 
You know what I mean? Just because then you have the right to work there or don't. Right, right, right. But they're not forcing you at gunpoint, whereas uh, the police officer is pointing you at gunpoint if you were to say, well, hey, I'll let you trade, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's do a, a, a service contract for I'll work for this amount. Sorry, it's not allowed to be under an arbitrary X amount. And yeah. they don't examine. Um, well, by giving people a minimum wage, too, it allows companies to say, well, this is going to be the minimum. Stay to this minimum. Well, th that's different from minimum yeah. wage laws, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So, but the thing is, with minimum wage laws in that in that regards, that their advocation for that requires the police state to enforce. Oh yeah, no, right? no, that's what I'm. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, like I think once again, I talk about principle. I think having a minimum wage, everyone starts here at this amount is good. But mm -hmm. when a third party uses force to say this is what we think it should be, and you have to do it otherwise, then right? And what's preventing people having a living wage when they talk about that? Government, taxes, yeah. add it all up. Half your income, gone, right? It's not Starbucks saying, here's the Starbucks tax. There's their FICA, there's their social, yeah. there's um, uh, like 15%, you know, state and, uh, and, and federal. All adds up. Sales tax, uh, imports, tariffs, uh, everything you bought has been taxed. Uh, currency is another tax, a depreciation of its value of its worth, right? But incomes never talk about that. I met uh, an IWW guy, Industrial Workers of the World, we're talking about unions at... Um, Richmond Gene Fest a couple years ago, and I was like, oh, it's just like all these different lists of like the way that people, these, these businesses are robbing from you. Starbucks telling you that you have to buy your own uniforms. So I'm with them to work there, right? Yeah, I had to buy my own uniforms, man. I worked at the. Did well, they point a gun at you and tell you had, uh, to buy that? No. No, right? Yeah. But the thing is, they're listing this different stuff and how they're, they're stealing from you, but nowhere on there do I see taxation, right? And yeah. I said, like, so what about taxes? Like, and they're like, oh, as long as you're stealing from capitalists, uh, it's, it's I mean, okay. Yeah, I wasn't stoked about having to buy my uniform. I really Tax right off later on. Right, right, right. Dollars right. back. Yeah, but, but you know I, what I lost, else is not here anymore? What's that? IWW anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I lost more money than buying the uniform that one cost, than I did all the taxes I lost. Right. To support, I don't even know what it, what it went to. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, no. I mean, it's, it's somebody who mugs you in the alley and takes your wallet. Yeah, I want to know where that money's going to go spend yeah. either. Right. It's like, don't worry, I'll, I'll put a dollar in a charity of uh, my choice. Oh, yeah. I guess that's okay <laughs> now. Please, please don't buy drugs with my money, please. Right. <laughs> that's what government says. Don't worry, we'll try to hurt not as much peaceful people out there. So we'll, we'll do what we can. I mean, I saw Kent State. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. I mean, my, that's my grandparents. They probably got a penny in that fight. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, the sniper. Uh, well, I'm uh, talking. Yeah, Kent, no, Kent State. State was the uh, the, the, the spray. No, Kent State was the National Guard in the like shooting uh, the, early the 70s people there, killing. right? Yeah, yeah the yeah, Vietnam yeah. protesters. Okay, yeah, horrific. Vietnam, for instance. My, my my grandparents' money probably went to fund Vietnam. Yes. Horrific, horrific. That's one thing. If my if I if you could tell me all of your money is going to help people who need it, such as the poor, I'd be like, I'm not stoked you're taking my money, but you know what? But it's not. It's going to things I don't agree with. Right. It's not called charity. I mean, it's a uh, force, right? It's not, it's, well, don't worry. It's going to go to charities. Well, you're, you're putting a gun on me. You're robbing me. Yeah. It's yeah. not given consensually. Like, I think from a religious perspective, from my religious perspective, you need to help people. If you see someone yeah. who's hungry, you have to feed them. I feel them. like I have an obligation to help others. Right? Yes, I have to. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, so Jesus was homeless. Right. I mean, you have to help people in your camp. There will always be homeless amongst us, but you always have to help. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and but, the best way to do that first, like, how do you help the poor by not being poor yourself? And then anything extra, you can start enriching the lives of others. Exactly. Right? Absolutely. Uh, these are kind of values I hold myself to, helping a lot of people here enrich and find homes, find jobs. Um, so where do, you, where do you get your morality from? Where would you classify that? Where does my morality? Uh, I guess it's uh, internal recognition of consent, I guess. Uh, I guess maybe looking at... Um, Bushido, when I was a teenager, kind of growing up, uh, trying to do the right thing, the righteous thing out there, regardless of who they are or mm -hmm. uh, who, what kind of uh, the enemy is disguised as or what title or costume that they were, and just always trying to do the right thing from there. Um, and I think that uh, hurt, you, you, you recognize the areas in which it does hurt people, right? Rape, murder, theft, and assault. I don't think people quite enjoy that. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's, I would say, my morality of that, just respecting people's sh shit, respecting people's uh, belongings, their property, their body. Um, it's not mine to dictate otherwise. That would make me a ruler myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess in terms of anarchy being without political rulers, against would be tyrants and slave masters. That's what it is. Right, it is. That's, yeah, it's, it's, without, it's without a ruler. It's right, a without a ruler. And that's anarchy. That's the morality aspect of it because we're against those who violently force their opinions and ideas onto others, onto peaceful people. It all clicked together when I finally figured out, when I really ran across the non-aggression axiom, that it was just, I was wondering how could you be both an anarchist and without force? I was like, well, how would, how would you, and then it, it made sense once you read more into it that, right, right. that pacifism is an important part of this. Right. And the part of a lot of things is people ignore it. Right. Yeah, we're, we're not, uh, we're against initiation force, but defending yourself from mm -hmm. the initiation force is not the initiation of force, right? Self-defense. Yes, self-defense, right. You run across those things, you're like, 
I'm supposed to dislike this, but I don't. <laughs> it's almost like it's almost like Plato's cave. Right. Yeah. It you is walk away and you, you go back. All your friends. Hey, check this out, and they all look at you like you're crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess, yeah. And you end up on a college campus with a microphone. Right. We're, we're here. We're, we're at the Plato's Cave uh, uh, Agora Marketplace area, in which they kind of went out there to speak yeah. this kind of philosophy and, and share it with others. Yeah. Uh, we actually do uh, Stoicism as well. Are you familiar with Stoicism? Uh, to a minor degree. To a minor degree. So we do meetups. Actually, tomorrow we're supposed to have one, but it might be raining. Uh, so we do Stoicism, uh, practicing in terms of like uh, internal freedom. Right, controlling your, your emotions, your thoughts, uh, ways to kind of live your life in accordance to the values that you uphold and value. Um, so there's a great many of us that to go there, um, from atheists to Christians to Jewish. You, <laughs> you have a whole eclectic mix of backgrounds very, of people who go. Very pluralistic. Yeah. The way it should be. <laughs> yeah, the way it should be, right? Um, we can get there to this uh, the place where we want to go. We can't do it alone without one another. Eventually, together, we can have the willpower to grow this community here in Richmond and eventually to grow in size, maybe uh, 15 years from now, to eventually uh, abolish government altogether, right? Stop giving into the fear of what happens if you don't surrender your property, withholding tax, and government collapses and it's gone. Uh, that was uh, Milton Friedman's greatest sin, the withholding tax, uh, because he knew that people don't generally surrender the property on time, they were kind of late, so withholding tax makes sure that everyone's property is robbed all the time at the end of the year in April, right? It's up to you to decide whether they rob too much or too little. So that's their lifeblood. Without that, gone. It'd be like Detroit. Uh, there's, there's nothing uh, to sustain this stuff anymore. But that's our long-term goal in the immediate uh, time, just uh, growing the tribe, uh, growing the community, reaching out to one another and finding champions of liberty. Uh, people like yourself <laughs> that's really very studious of this sort of stuff. That's amazing. You're way ahead of the curve over a lot of people here in Richmond. That's like to be. anarchy, like 400 level stuff that you're like uh, reading into already. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, reading his videos on YouTube where he just talks about everything. It's right. On the background. Polycentric legal systems and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, he's he's uh, said he would be more than happy because we do freedom gatherings. So he you, said. Do you he, know him personally? Uh, I, 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 we write sometimes. I write to him like messages on Facebook and such. Um, and he said he'd be more than happy to do like uh, a Q and A or, or talk or whatnot at one of our freedom gatherings. So we'd have him like what do you mean? on a uh, at one of our houses. But he would do it like uh, behind a, uh, a camera, for example. And I have like a big screen that we can do like audience questions and all that sort of stuff. So maybe we'll do that later in the summer, maybe like yeah. August or something like that. Cool. Um, but yeah, uh, that's I don't know the most enriching. Rich, enriching aspect of this is meeting other anarchists and meeting other people who realize they were anarchists for the most part. Just a lot of people don't know they are. Right. <laughs> and that's kind of all you have to do. Uh, that's my leave, obligation. They never leave the cave. Yeah, right, right. And once they do, they, I think the sun hurts your eyes at first. And you a little bit, light. right, right. But then you see all the people outside there having fun, uh, enjoying themselves, uh, living bring people out of the cave, but they, they won't acknowledge it. Uh, some people take some time, you know, they, they see a little light, it's like, all right, we'll take a little, you know, closer look over there. I think there. that realization does take a while. Yeah. Because you have to un untrain yourself, you have to re-educate yourself, you have to, like, rethink it first. It is a lot, yeah. Just, like, just view how, you have to view things how you, you weren't supposed to view them. Right. How you didn't want to view them. It's like up is down, left is right, black and white, everything's backwards. Social contract, not real, oh my gosh, taxation is theft, what the hell's going on, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a tax slave. Uh, this actually actually happened in one like one of the other videos. Like, wait a minute, I feel like a slave. And she's like, <laughs> I was like, yes, we are. Um, but some people can get it really fast on one conversation, and that's why we take the non-political approach and reaching out and using our real voice to talk with one another. And we can get there faster and just having these these one-on-ones versus the area in the political realm is which takes. All right, we'll go out there and talk to people every four years behind a booth, behind a curtain, and. The measure of success of that is it takes forever. It's not very transparent. Right. Will will certainly die as a tax slave at that rate. Mm -hmm. So our measure of success, we have over 100 uh, anarchists now in our tribe. Uh, we have our is this all Richmond-centric? Yeah, all Richmond-centric. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're going to be having our second festival in October. Uh, looking at this interesting prospect, uh, 23 acres, we're going to build our stage, uh, target range out there. It borders a lake. Uh, so we go swimming, fishing, uh, the works, and uh, I'm meeting up with them tomorrow, actually, to kind of finalize some points. But after that, later next week, you should hear uh, the finalization of that and the marketing that we go for. It's called Anarchon. And so, clever. yeah, <laughs> my buddy Panzer came up with the name. That's almost, that's almost as clever as the, what was the cynics? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cynicals, whatever it was. Skepticals, yeah. Skepticals. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, the Skeptic Society groups. Uh, but yeah, so that's, uh, we have a lot of stuff. Too? We got patches too. I have too. a jacket. We got a jacket? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give you guys some patches. Putting together a new jacket right now. Right? So. Nice, nice. Yeah. Especially with the punk stuff. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly black metal. 
right? some funk in there too. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, uh, let me give you guys some more information. Uh, we're at the such a pleasure. Thank you so much for stopping by, man. Of course. And uh, bring your buddy out next time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I was actually, there, uh, there was reports that these Maoist communists were supposed to be tabling that day, and they packed up like in 20 minutes and ran away. Yeah, I saw them. I, I, why, why Maoism? Right. Why, why is that, is that the kind of communism that appeals to the kids nowadays? Right. Yeah, I don't. Mao wasn't a nice dude. He was not a nice dude. How many yeah. parents uh, were forced into starvation into eating their children? Lots. Well, if you look at the, if you look at all the figureheads, it all ended it. I understand the, like, if you read the manifesto, how, okay, I see what he's trying to say. But you realize that all has to happen through force. Yeah. You need yeah. a state for that. Now, yeah. so, the so reins of government are not just going to fall away magically. Right. And once it's at, there, at it's least, not going at to least, play. at least, Vladimir Lenin in his communist writings had the. He at least said that the only way to keep the communist state was through force. Mao still had the delusion well, that the reins of government was going to fall away because his brand of communism was mostly peasant based, whereas Vladimir Lenin's was more based on the uh, the workers and like the industrial place. Right. Yeah. That's not communist to me. I just find that like a giant oxymoron. It's a death cult. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I think mean, it just—that's what always got me. Is just you, you don't have to agree with everything I'm saying. You just don't have to. It doesn't have to affect me. Right. Yeah. Your words and ideas are not threatening. Right. When there's a gun back there and threats no, there, uh, yeah, there's that's the crazy stuff. And what do they do to people who uh, don't uh, follow through? They call it uh, repression. You repress them, not murder them, not cage them, not uh, force them to eat just like they're, they're not interrogations anymore. They're interviews. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we call them by a different name in this 21st century. Yeah. We have, yeah. We gotta find update our lingo a little bit. <laughs> well, let me give you a, a flyer and all that stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed that spreading anarchy video. I certainly did. Uh, that actually occurred about an hour or two ago. So I'm back home right now, uh, editing and producing these videos for you. And if you guys want to help me produce a lot more spreading anarchy videos that comes out hopefully one day on a daily basis, every single day, uh, 365 days a year, check out the Patron account description in the link below. And the next screen will also have a link for you guys to watch as well to, to help me to produce at my most optimal level uh, what I do best, spreading anarchy. And for Nathan and Shane out there, I got your anarchy uh, badges here as well for the next time that we meet. And so with that, Thank you guys so much for your patience. Most importantly, I know these are not uh, your typical one, two minute video segment bites that you find out there. And see you guys at the victory party. Stay living. refuse to kiss ass quick fast. I'm ready to mask because of my tormented past. Swallow the pain, follow the mental terrain. It takes a hell of a man nowadays to maintain. Garments bloodstained, face bruised and battered. Eyes reflect agony of dreams that were shattered. It never mattered to the so-called general public about my nation's situation and how we rise above it. And they love it. When we self-destruct and kill a home and the greater responsibility, yes, it's still a home. We should know by now that the system is designed for our demise. If we ain't wise, we'll be left behind. The dollar signs rule. But what about the fool who falls victim to the material?